Uh, so now I'm going to step, step through a bit of each of the designs. So these are discrete designs that we have. Um, and I think I mentioned on the first slide is uh, you know, we have a site called xrdocs.io where we publish a lot of blogs and other information. And there's a specific URL, xrdocs.io slash design, where you'll find a lot more information, even, even what I'm going to post in here today. So if people want to follow along or, or not, that's fine. Because um, this is really you know, consolidating about three hours of material into about an hour. Um, so there's a lot more information on there that you guys can uh, take a look at. So I think on the yeah, second slide, I mentioned you know, what, you know, Cisco Metro Fabric, what is it? Um, and really, it boils down to a, a design that fits you know, Metro business uh, kind of access services. Um, so when we talk about uh, Metro Fabric, it's, it's really kind of how we build that end-to-end -end, uh, universal fabric that interconnects, you know, it might be data center endpoints, it might be uh, access endpoints for you know, fiber-based customers, and maybe backhaul networks, and how we interconnect those uh, across that kind of Metro network. And you know, it's, it's a little bit of a misnomer to call it Metro Fabric because it really spans you know, metros across core. It's really you know, any, any kind of different domain in the network, uh, this is, is focused on. It's not just within a single kind of Metro area. Uh, but I talked a little bit about some of the, all the things that you know, we're doing with it as far as simplifying the transport, um, having unified you know, BGP-based control planes. So you know, for services. So like I said, eVPN and Layer 3 VPN are really the service types that we're supporting. Um, and those are really the two different service types that, you know, that should be left from all the legacy services that we had. Um, and we're using just BGP for all of that. What are some of the drivers for, for you know, why we're doing this, why we're looking at you know, design evolutions for, for metros? Um, a lot of it is comes down to you know having better end-to-end -end control over things like paths. You hear a lot of um, a lot of talk about things like network slicing in 5G. It's how do we support that? How do we support multiple services that have multiple constraints over the same basic infrastructure? Um, and obviously, you know, uh, Kevin talked a bit about it this morning. Um, you know, speeds are increasing. Um, ARPU or revenue from from users is is not increasing at all, uh, or it's generally not increasing. You know, so they have to find ways to or, you know, optimize networks to make them simpler to operate. Um, there's obviously a CapEx co component of all that, but the OpEx is, is another huge component of, of operating those networks and how we make them easier to operate is, is fairly important. And here's kind of the, the thousand foot view of, of all of sort of the, the protocols and things that are involved in how I, how I build the Metro fabric. Um, and obviously, I mentioned you know, NSO kind of sits on the top. NSO takes care of service provisioning, um, as well as some cases, you know, uh, infrastructure migration or even you know, in the future service migration. Um, so that's really the, the entry point where that, that initial service is being configured. And then I think, you know, Jose, I'll dive into it a little deeper. Jose mentioned a little bit about SRPCE. So SR is a segment routing path computation element, and that's the element that's responsible for computing paths end to end across the network. Um, you know, in a tr traditional distributed control plane like LDP or R I should say RCT, RSVBTE, you know, supports PCEs as well. Um, but you know, outside of it, you know, it's you have a fully distributed control plane. Where there's no outside centralized control. In this case, the SRPC is a, sort of a critical part of how we how we build those end-to-end -end paths, especially with constraints. Um, and then obviously, on the you know the bottom here, you see. SR, SR is a, a, a critical part of this. Um, and really what we're talking here is, you know, I have Metro fabrics on either side of a core, but the core is still part of it. The core is an SR enabled core that enables all of this kind of end-to-end transparency. So I have a question for you on that. If I want to interop into a legacy LDP environment, like what does that look like as I'm an, an SP transitioning into this model? Because obviously you're not going to just be have one big bang yeah. into this. What does that world yeah, look so, like? Yeah, so I mean, I've got, uh, we have a bit more of that in the core fabric, okay. but, it, it, but it's, a, it's migration that we've tackled. Um, so like an LDP-based network. A lot of people have LDP-based networks or RSBT today. Sure. Uh, LDP-based networks, you know, there's, a, there's a, a feature that we have or a technology called like a segment routing mapping server. Mm -hmm. And what that can do is it can actually translate between an LDP domain and an SR domain. Um, so it takes care of you know just uh, you know distributing uh, you know and these are kind of centralized elements. But you know translating like if I've got an LDP uh, you know fac uh, an IP address with a certain label, mm -hmm. it basically injects that into the SR IGP with a specific SID, and then at the boundaries it understands how to translate that between 
And that's a router that does that translation? Yeah, it's the router that's like a piece of code that are in iOS XR that actually yeah. so XR, we have that function. Yeah, so we have a you know, segment routing mapping server is a function in, in XR. Gotcha. And we typically say to people, we deploy that as a virtual function. Uh, you know, don't put that on your box. So it doesn't have to also, be. It doesn't have to be in path. <coughs> exactly. Gotcha. Just like yeah. a just like a route reflector that's yeah. So we have some. We have some, yeah. So we have some large deployments today that you know uh, really just have two two mapping servers for redundancy. Gotcha. And uh, just to keep it simple, otherwise it actually gets a little complicated because you got more elements injecting stuff into the IGP and it gets a little funky that way. But we I've got more in the core fabric and how we actually have. You know, done automation to help assist in those types of migrations. So, is the like, you know, yeah, how I go from, you know, legacy to this is is an important part. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So here's kind of a you know a bit of an eye chart of kind of what are the transport components like what makes up that end to end segment routing transport path. Um, and one thing that you kind of notice in the the first bullet point though is like each domain, whether it's you know, and sometimes providers they have an access area and aggregation area. Some have a pre-aggregation area and then a core. Um, in this design, each one of those is actually a different ISIS process. Um, so it's not even a different ISIS, you know, say an area uh, off of, you know, it might, it's not just like a level two and then a level one hanging off of that. That may be there in some parts of the network, but this is really having a, you know, discrete process at every boundary of the network. Um, you may ask, well, how do things work end to end there? And that's how the, that's where the PCE comes into play. Uh, the PCE is the one that glues together all those what are now kind of inter-domain inter inter paths. Um, and the idea is we can do that with constraints uh, using SR and using the PCE. Um, and that's one of the benefits we get off something like uh, BGPLU. Uh, so BGPLU has been, the, you know, been around for a number of years now, and it's how people scale inter-domain networks or just even you know, networks in general very high. Uh, but what I don't get with BGPLU is inter-domain constraints. Um, I get constraints within that specific domain, but I can't do that cross domain and keep the scale that I want. Um, something that Jose talked about earlier today uh, was on-demand SRTE policies. Um, that's the other thing we use in order to scale the network higher. Um, you know, BGPLU, it, it, it relies on the construct that I'm distributing labels everywhere on the entire network. Um, it gets a little messy, because like I know I said before, there's networks today that are you know, approaching, you know, 200,000 nodes. Um, so in order for access nodes to, to really handle that kind of scale, I have to do probably complex, I have to do more complex filtering at different parts of the network to filter out, you know, those BGPLU prefixes at certain points. Um, ODN kind of eliminates that because I, now I don't need to distribute that, those labels for that end to end reachability across the entire network. Um, I just get the path when I need to get the path. If I need to reach uh, a node on the far end of the network, um, for that service, um, I only build that path or need that label switch path. Uh, you know, if that is a, a node participating in the service that I'm I'm participating in. Uh, the other thing we you know utilize is this idea of you know transport transport and service route reflectors. Um, I think BGP service route reflectors have been around for some time. It's really it's how I scale VPN v4 or you know now eVPN routes across a, a large network. Uh, where we use transport route reflectors is, is how we get topology into the PCE. Um, so I, I don't talk about it on this slide, but you know, we're us using BGPLS or BGP link state um, to really represent that IGP topology in uh, BGP NLRI. And that's how we're communicating topology information to the PCE is through BGPLS. And that's constantly updated as topology changes happen. Here's kind of just a, a you know a data a data plane diagram uh, of kind of the end-to-end -end transport in something that's three domains, uh, which is really just an access core access, um, and you can see A1 is is speaking to the to the SRPC, uh, and I think you know Jose really talked about it. You know the thing is is only that A1 node has the state of that path. Um, the other nodes across that they're they're learning the adjacent SID information uh, through the IGP, uh, but really if it's a the programmable path, the state of that entire path is only on that node, unlike a protocol like RSBTE where really every node is participating in that full path. Um, one thing you also see is this notion of an AnyCast SID. Um, I don't know if I don't go into too much detail in this, you know, if you look online and look at the, the kind of high-level design, you'll find more information on it. Uh, but through, you know, segment routing, we have this idea that we can 
assign the same SID to you know, multiple loopback addresses, or assign the same SID to multiple nodes. Um, and the, what the SRPCE does, it can actually take that into, into account. It knows that those two nodes have the same SID. So when it computes an end-to-end -end path between those domains, um, it uses just the same, uh, you know, AnyCast SID S1. And across from A1 to that AnyCast SID is, a, is, is an IGP domain. Um, so it really just uses any IGP path it can. And this is more of a use case where this is not a constraint pa constrained path. It may be a best effort service. Uh, but it can use either of those nodes as an exit point. Um, there's some, you know, gotchas that you have to, you know, keep in mind with that in that, you know, if my connection to the core is down on one node, uh, you potentially could black hole traffic. And that's why we're, we're working on things to do uh, kind of path verification. So we can tie that uplink interface to an AnyCast SID if that, and then, if that goes down, it'll stop redistributing that SID into the IGP. Um, so I just some, some things to keep in mind um, if you're doing deployments like this. This is kind of my one slide on you know, what is SRPCE, and I don't know how many people have some uh, background knowledge of SRPCE. But it's a function in SR. We mentioned that SR, the mapping server, is just a function that runs within XR. The PCE is too. Um, if you download any kind of modern XR release, it has SRPC in it. You can enable it, you can turn it on, you can use it. Um, uh, we typically, within like this design, you know, we make them centralized and offline, or not offline, but they're centralized, they're not in line of the traffic path. It's usually kind of best practice to deploy it that way. Uh, but what it can do is it, it, you know, it ingests topology information, uh, either through BGPLS, or you can actually make it part of the IGP uh, we typically don't recommend that either, because if you really truly want it to be centralized, PGPLS is a better option for how you, you know, inject that topology information into it. Uh, but it can identify, you know, when we talk about BGPLS, you know, if you have different IGP areas, there are different identifiers on those. Um, so the PCE knows about each domain. It, it knows where the domain boundaries are at, and then it can calculate that interdomain path knowing where all those different boundaries are at. Um, and today we support, uh, you know, computation based on like, you know, shortest path, disjoint paths, um, low latency, and then SRLG avoid avoidance. Um, and we talk about low latency. Uh, I think Jose talked about it this, this morning is really, you know, using the actual network latency. Um, you know, today we could do it using, you know, static metrics that you assign on links. Um, but, you know, uh, forthcoming is, you know, really using the, the actual data plane uh, latency uh, in real time. And, and that, those values uh, are also like distributed through BGPLS. So there's extensions to OSPF and ISIS to actually distribute that latency kind of information throughout the network. Um, and that's what SRPC is using. So that same information gets distributed to BGPLS. So SRPC knows um, you know, what the latency topology looks like for the entire network. Uh, we call it fundamentally distributed. Um, so there's no state shared between multiple SRPCs. It's much more like a route reflector. And the PSAP protocol itself is built that way to have active standby. Um, it does look, you know, more like a route reflection kind of hierarchy than, uh, it's much simpler that way than to have, say, a cluster of nodes that are sharing state between all of those nodes. We do have a northbound API in SRPC. So if you have some other kind of controller that you want to program an SR path, uh, you can do that. Uh, this is ODN. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this because I think we talked about it a couple of different times. Uh, but on, it's really on-demand uh, you know, SR policies. And really, it's, it's as simple as a specific community tagged on a route is triggering a, uh, a path computation call for the next top of that BGP route. Um, like I said, there's really nothing more complicated than that. Um, but that community, based on what that community is, and really all I'm using is I'm using, you know, inbound uh, routing policy to identify how I should handle that community. Um, you know, I can actually choose to make it, you know, a local path computation. I could go to the PCE, and I could also specify constraints with that, too. Um, so in that case, you know, if I want a low latency path, this community means low latency path. This community means a like, best effort path for the same next top because I can actually have multiple SR policies between my A node and a Z node. Like I said, it's really a, a way to help scale the network without having to, having to distribute endpoint information everywhere. Uh, just 
doing it as it as it comes. And we've had previous things like you know LDP downstream on demand, which never really took off very much, um, but it had deficiencies where uh, you know I didn't it, the model of doing that was was fairly poor, um, and I didn't have a way to do any kind of constraint based services. This is a much more elegant way to to tackle that problem. Uh, so we talked about the, the metro fabric design. Uh, you know, it's really about VPN services. Uh, and we're really, you know, BGP-based control plane for all services. Uh, I, I don't think that's new. It's probably not much different than other vendors are doing. It's eVPN and layer three VPN. Um, like I said, eVPN is really the, the key for kind of unified, you know, L2 services. Um, and what we're supporting, you know, and when I say supporting in the context of the designs, it's really what we validated. Uh, there's other things that we may support. There may be bleeding edge things that Cisco is doing in you know, 661. If we haven't validated it, then it's not part of our design yet. Um, so really it's you know, looking at you know, single active, active, active services. Jerry talked a lot about how eVPN could support active, active multi-homing much easier than previous methods. Um, so we're supporting all of that with this end-to-end -end design. And then service provisioning through NSO. So if there's any services I'm talking about, um, we have a service model to support the provisioning of that uh, using NSO. Um, and we expect that, you know, th those are pretty hard to use off the shelf. We expect them to be modified, but it gives people a starting point on, hey, this is what it should look like. These are the provisioning steps, and this is sort of an example of, of how to do it. In the data center, we're using eVPN for layer three VPNs. So I'm just yeah. curious. So kind of in the, why. well, I mean, so you can use it for layer, like layer three routing. And that's fine. And Jiri gave examples of that. Yeah. Um, the layer three VPN really comes into play when you have a dynamic protocol between the CE and the PE. And that's a little different. You know, data center is mostly host based. Um, not that people aren't doing, you know, BGP and things like that, but there's some specific language in the, the eVPN RFC prohibiting that. Um, the idea was to not have eVPN provide uh, a way to peer. Uh, like a routing control plane between your infrastructure and your, your CE device. Um, and whether it stays that way is, remains to be seen. Because the way things are trending is a bit more towards supporting more and more layer three in eVPN. And even more with IRB and those types of functions, uh, those are the things we're doing. But we still stayed away from, say, peering BGP or injecting BGP routes into eVPN from a host. Um, and I think even, you know, that's something I think most have kind of stayed, stayed away from to try to, to keep that a little more pure. Like I said, I don't know if it's going to stay that way. But uh, I see in the data center when there's like border leaves and you have some sort of peering, peering there happening mm -hmm. on BRFs that are then transferred in the eVPN fabric as type fives. Exactly. But I yeah. do see that there. Oh, yeah. And yeah, and Jerry didn't talk too much about that, but we definitely see that with data center interconnect a lot yeah. is where we, we're trans creating type fives uh, to simplify kind of that end-to-end -end architecture. And it, and it really comes down to, you know, if I have, if I want a single service type that can support both layer two and layer three in a simple way. Um, but like I said, where layer three VPN still is, is, is where I do need dynamic routing. We still see a lot of, you know, OSPF between PEs and CEs. I wouldn't recommend that. That's not part of the metro design. <laughs> uh, or RIP, or RIP, that you know, people use RIP still for that type of stuff. I mean, mainly B NG. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you need V six support, yeah, and something we don't, we haven't really talked much about in most of these presentations is V six and all of this. We sure. we valid, you know, the service constructs are all V six based. And today, the Metro Fabric it is all uh, segment routing MPLS. Uh, we heard about SRV six from Jakob. SRV six is sort of a next generation technology. It'll come when it comes, and there's a lot of benefits, but we're, we're not there yet as an industry. Um, and this is kind of just a, an overview of, you know, the service types that we support. And we have this notion of a hierarchical, hierarchical service and a flat service. A flat service is really I've got two provisioning endpoints. They may be anywhere on the network, and I can uh, support that, that service across the entire network. A hierarchical is really where sometimes I have a simplified access network where, you know, maybe I don't want to run layer 3 VPN on the far edge of my network. Um, I want to consolidate those layer 3 VPN services on a, on a PE in a, in a local data center. So I'm just using a simple kind of ac layer two access point to point pseudo wire to connect into that, that more advanced service. We see that in a lot of providers, especially the you know, LDP based services where they just have a point to point layer two pseudo wire, it goes into a VPLS, it's a really similar concept. Um, so it keeps the access probably a little bit simpler than extending layer three VPN uh, all the way to the edge. 
yeah, this is just a very simple example of, you know, uh, access to access. So I have, a, I have a service, and the only two provisioning endpoints are the A <laughs> nodes on the sides. Um, there's no intermediate service hierarchy for scale or anything like that. It's, it's just a flat end-to-end -end service. And, and today we're supporting layer 3 VPN and then what we call eVPN VPWS, which is really just point-to-point -point pseudo wires. And a hierarchical example, um, like a common example of Cisco is, is something we call like pseudo wire head end. And pseudo wire head end is really where I'm, I'm terminating that layer two circuit into uh, like a layer three gateway. Um, and it's really to a device, you know, Typically, that PE device would be like an ASR9000, which has you know very high scale. And I'm kind of centralizing how I do that kind of layer three termination. Um, it's really just breaking that service into to multiple parts across the network. Um, in the case of like, say, the Fabric 1.0 that we're doing right now, uh, like an eVPN ELAN service, which is similar to VPLS, um, is a hierarchical service. Um, so I'm basically, my, my ELAN service exists on that kind of, uh, you know, v, the PE device, which is usually a higher touch, higher feature type device. Uh, but we are, we are expanding the ELAN to be a flat service as well over time. Um, a couple of like simple use cases that we've looked at, um, like converged cable access. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with things like RFI and RPDs and how cable is evolving from more of an analog infrastructure to an ethernet based infrastructure. Um, so the idea now is that since I do have a, an Ethernet edge to a cable network, you know, I want to use that, that Ethernet edge to support multiple service types, not just cable. Uh, so today they might be uh, terminating just cable access on that, but the idea is to converge that, all those different kind of business VPN services, mobile backhaul services on a single kind of converged fabric that can support all those different services. Uh, Today, a lot of SPs, they have kind of siloed parallel networks for a lot of these different functions. So the idea is to collapse that into a, to a you know, kind of a single fabric that can support multiple, uh, multiple services. And then 5G, um, you'll hear 5G a lot. So you know, our solution for 5G backhaul is really Metro Fabric. It's, a, it's an IP, SR, MPLS-based uh, backhaul network. Um, and it supports, you know, I'm not gonna go into all the 5G technology, backhaul and mid-haul and front-haul and all those different things. Uh, but it's really an end-to-end -end fabric that connects that, um, you know, end site, uh, end 5G site to kind of a, usually, usually the user plane functions are in a data center somewhere. It's how I get that, that traffic from that end site to the user plane function. And that's over this kind of seamless fabric. Um, here's kind of a service, uh, service example that I have um, that kind of goes over the different components and different automation components that we have. Um, so this is a kind of a very simple, simple network of three domains. Um, uh, like I said, there's a core domain, and the core domain is pretty, pretty much transparent to all of this because this is an end-to-end -end flat service. Um, so typically, NSO is the, the component that's uh, configuring like a layer, th layer three VPN. So it's configuring your RD, your RT, your interface, your VRF type of things. Uh, and it's doing that on, on both ends. Um, a couple of components that I'll, I'll point out is that the TRR at the top there and the TRR is really the, uh, I'll say the transport route reflector. So it's what's collecting topology information from the rest of the network. Um, so typically you'll have, you know, in each domain, I'll have, you know, one or two sessions to different TRRs off of, it could be the PE devices, it really just has to be any device that uh, belongs to that IGP. Um, it, needs, it needs to give that information to the, uh, the SRPC so it could compute the end-to-end -end paths. Uh, the SRR is simply just a BGP route reflector for, for service routes, which is pretty, pretty typically deployed today. Um, so really after that happens, you know, my CE would you know, advertise a specific route um, to my you know, A bang, I guess. <laughs> that might be a typo. Um, so you know, that router, you know, it gets that route. Um, and then it advertises that to sort of the rest of the, uh, the network, which is a typical thing. The one thing that's different you'll see is that you know, I, have, I now have this ODN tag on there. And the ODN is a specific community that's gonna, you know, it's gonna tell the far end node, um, hey, I don't, this, you need to compute a path using, say, the SRPCE to that other node. You know, and that's kind of exactly what happens. The A2 node, once it receives that route with that specific ODN tag, uh, it tells it, it structs it, hey, I need a path to that far end next top to uh, A2. Um, and SRPC then returns that, that path. And today that's all over PSEP. PSEP is completely standardized. The SR extensions to PSEP are, are being standardized. Uh, so all of that is, is open today. 
and we've done some good interop tests with other vendors on uh, SRPCE and PC, you know, and there's, there's some you know, ways to get there because uh, this, is, this is fairly new technology, but you know, we'll get there and it's, like I said, it's all open, it's all IETF standards based. Um, yeah, so once, you know, once it gets that, gets that path, it, uh, it you know, computes that, the SRPC returns the path, um, and then my end-to-end -end path is there because it's really only important to the end nodes. The end nodes have that complete stack on how to get to the far end node. Um, so I'm not touching a bunch of other nodes. There's not a lot of other provisioning that's happening. Um, and that node, you know, can be prescriptive across the path. It could be a best effort path. Um, and SRPC will actually do uh, some notion of, uh, you know, label compression. So it'll optimize that path. I think that came up earlier was, you know, I have, you know, potentially could have a lot of uh, what we call SIDs in the stack. Um, and hardware, you know, the, the ability to support like a, a really uh, large depth of SIDs uh, in hardware is difficult, uh, especially on, you know, kind of the hardware at the access edge of the, the, the networks. So the SRPC will take steps to optimize what that label stack looks like. Uh, like I said, it knows where each domain boundary is. It knows how to reach end-to-end uh, -end across those domains. Um, so it does some notion of label stack compression, which is probably a, a whole other presentation in, in itself. Um, the last couple slides I have on Neo Metro is really kind of topology options that we've looked at. Um, and something we see in most service providers today is you know, this idea of a traditional inline PE. Um, and that's really where you see those you know, kind of hierarchical services. Um, if all of my services are being touched by that PE device, and when we say PE, we typically mean a device that has really high edge scale, um, like an ASR 9K or other vendors have similar devices. Um, it's where I can you know, terminate 10,000 VPN services, which I can't do on the edge of the network. So if all of my you know, services are gonna be terminating there, it makes sense to use that as an inline device. Uh, what we see more often or what's coming you know, in the future a bit is building more of a fabric-based approach where those PEs are not always in line for all the traffic. And I don't have it, driven, I don't have it here, but we see more of like, a, say, local data centers. Things coming with like 5G where you know, my data center may not always be on the other side of that, that core. It may be part of the metro. So if I have a lot of east-west traffic, um, and I'll say the, the ports on the PE device are sometimes substantially more than the ports on those aggregation devices. So if I don't need to send all my traffic through those, uh, there's probably better topology options to optimize the network for doing that. Oh, and here's some of the options. So like I said, a lot of it comes down to me to like east-west services, it depends on data center placement, things like that. You wanna optimize your topology um, to probably take the, the least cost path uh, from a CapEx standpoint, as, as you want to, or as you can. And I'm guessing with the non-inline PE, that makes it easier for that to become a virtual network function if it's a non-inline. Well, absolutely, PE. and I, yeah, I don't have the, the virtual network, yeah, physical or virtual. Right. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So if I've got a DC off of there, then yeah, um, there's no point in having it go through a, a fairly expensive And then you just port. scale with x86 instead of scaling with hardware for PE services. Yeah, potentially, yeah, yeah. it depends on what you're trying to do, but yeah. Uh, so that was kind of a thousand foot view of the uh, the core, so next I'll cover kind of core fabric. Um, and this one's probably a bit shorter in, in time. Uh, but it always has the same tenets as all the other type of designs we're looking at. You know, scalable, available, simple, and automated. Um, and really, these are kind of the optimization criteria in the core that we're looking at, is how do we take what we have today and, and simplify it? The core connects lots of other different things. Um, so primarily, in most SPs, it's, tr it's, it's a transport box. It's a P node, it's an LSR. Um, so it's not doing any kind of like service termination. Uh, usually, you know, the most complex things it's doing is things like RSBT, RSBT fast reroute. Um, and obviously every SP is different. They build the cores different. So there may be LDP, there may be RSBTE. Um, in most cases today, we see TE, RSBTE being used mainly for fast reroute. Um, there are a lot of networks that are use it for bandwidth kind of emission control, uh, but more use it just, just to support fast reroute today. So we look at simplifying the core, kind of, you know, what are the things we want to look at simplifying? It, the one thing we look at is like failure domains. Um, and how do we solve like, uh, you know, shrinking the failure domains of a single failure? Uh, we look at it through like horizontally scalable designs or scaled out designs. Um, upgrades, uh, you know, 
And this gets to, you know, there's, there's a lot behind the covers of this. Like, you know, upgrade gets into things like, uh, you know, RP switchovers, uh, ISSU. Those are fairly complicated things. Um, and in this design, we try to move from those sort of complexities to like drain and reboot, which is really comes from like the data center or web type people. Um, it's easier just to move traffic off that box and reboot it as fast as I can, rather than do these, all these compl complicated things to try to maintain state and traffic flowing through that box during some sort of upgrade cycle. Um, the control plane, you know, the Kessling routing is a part of that. In protection through TILFA, TLFA is uh, topology independent loop free alternates, and that's really what gives me uh, fast reroute protection using just segment routing. Um, so it's continually, you know, calculating, um, you know, we'll say a loop free alternate path between two different uh, two different parts of the network. At least that's probably a good presentation by itself. Um, it really is kind of the SR story again. It's really moving from, you know, what people have had for, for a long time is, you know, TE and TE is, RSPT has done a good job at doing things like FRR uh, for providers. Um, and people today are using LDP, they're using LDP over RSPT. It's really flattening all that to a single, uh, you know, protocol that's just running through the IGP. Um, and then supporting, you know, TLFA. Uh, TLFA gives me, 100, 100, you know, in most cases, 100% coverage uh, for fast reout uh, for both link and node failures. Very topology dependent. Um, if we look at scale, and this gets into, you know, some of the things around failure domains, is we had a, traditionally we sort of had two different ways we could scale networks. You could scale them up. And scaling up really meant buying a much bigger router, uh, more slots, more systems. We have things like multi-chassis. Um, and that was a way to, to scale my network higher um, and manage like a single device. And management was a big, big part of some of those decisions. The other option is to scale out. Um, I'm buying more systems. I'm potentially separating functions to different nodes. Um, but that's a, you know, the complexity of the first one is, is pretty complex. You know, we still sell multi-chassis systems. Um, but upgrading a multi-chassis system is usually a, a three-month planning exercise and not a you know, five second thing to, to figure out. Um, and sometimes those upgrades take all day. Um, it's very complicated. Um, it, meant to, you know, it was meant to make management easier on the provider, uh, but it's, to me, it's, it's never really worked the way people wanted it to work. Are you seeing, uh, in talking about the scale out versus the scale up, and the disaggregation that's happening in data centers and, and going away from a lot of chassis based devices, is that, are you seeing that scale out follow that trend as well? Uh, we are. We're starting to see that in, in SP networks, especially in the core, uh, where traditionally it might have been one, in some cases, multi chassis one device. Right. That's huge. Because I know we're seeing, you know, I'm seeing in some of the SP networks that I'm working on, um, which are, you know, small to medium ISPs, is that if I want to get into 100 gig, I may look at a 1U device that's 32 ports of 100 gig, and then I'm going to oh, see multiple iterations of that to form my core with ECMP and all the other, you know, goodies that you mentioned rather than the traditional, I'm going to get a chassis that's as tall as the data center. Yeah, and we still see both approaches these days. It depends on the SP you talk to, but more and more are trending towards using smaller Zero devices five. and more yeah. of them. <laughs> and like I said, I think this might be that's not automated. So this is one of the big reasons for it that we hear is that I talked about before is the blast radius of, a, of an issue. I think this is animated. There we go. Um, so yeah, I have that big complex multi-chassis system and we've seen things where like a bad BGP update will crater a, a non-Cisco multi-chassis system <laughs> and, uh, you know, it creates a huge, uh, you know, outage window uh, for that versus a kind of a small blast radius for that one device and most of the time, you know, devices go down for things like upgrades and maintenance. It's pretty, pretty rare that a, a whole device fails for some reason uh, from a hardware perspective. It's really upgrades that affect those things and yeah, if I can plan my outage for my upgrade, you know, in a day versus three months. That's a huge, diff you know, OPEX difference uh, in how I do that. It's probably more cost effective to do upgrades that way because you can scale as the business needs, not exactly. build it and hope the customers come. Right, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so core fabric, you know, I'm not gonna go through all the points here, but really it, it does function, you know, on that scale out approach. So yeah, if I'm moving to 100 gig, I, yeah, I could put in two, two kind of pizza box type boxes that, that today have a lot of scale, and that's really what helps us too, is that devices today pack so many ports into a single kind of one heart you device, it makes this a much more palatable thing um, than in the past. Because uh, I really, you know, for a lot of mid-sized networks even, um, I don't need a lot of boxes to support this. I may only have two boxes day one, 
and that's enough scale that I need. Uh, but then I can scale that out as I need to over time. And things like SR, they, they enable things like ECMP fairly easily um, without a lot of complexity. Um, so a big part of what we did with Core Fabric actually though is because the topology part of it's pretty simple. It's to tackle how do we migrate that network and that was the question that came up earlier is how do I migrate that network from a traditional kind of LDP based network or RSBTE to this newfangled SR stuff. Um, so we really went through, you know, looking at the different steps of how we enable like say SR on a network um, and then how we validate that. Um, and that's where some of the model driven stuff comes into play and the telemetry is utilizing things like telemetry and models to verify that what I've done on the network is happening. Uh, and it gets some of the kind of OEM aspects of how I operate the network and migrate it. Um, and they, like I said, these are a few different of the functions. And, and one specific is the mapping server. So if I do have an LDP-based network, uh, having automation to help deploy a mapping server uh, to the network. Uh, so I may not need to know, you know all of the commands to do that. And, and then having the verification behind it. Yeah, so here's one kind of example in, uh, in the, the online design that we have. There's a, there's a, it steps through most of the, the things that I talked about as far as migration goes. But it's taking what was a CLI command that's, you know, maybe a little bit cryptic to figure out. Um, turning that into, like, say, you have a netconf gang for, you know, what we call streaming telemetry. And then, you know, this is just a Grafana screenshot where I kind of instantly know, like, when I've enabled it and that I'm getting the, the appropriate number of labels uh, that I should see. Um, so I'm not counting a bunch, a bunch of stuff on the CLI. I'm, doing, I'm streaming this out at you know, five second intervals. Um, and if, I, if I see changes in that, I know that issues have occurred. Um, another thing is with, with TLFA. So TLFA, you know, there's specific you know, telemetry sensors that, that monitor those paths as well. So when I've enabled TLFA, I can almost instantly see when I enabled it and see uh, the population of those statistics um, you know, in a tool like Grafana. Um, I think Mike mentioned, like, this is all using Pipeline. Pipeline is an open source tel telemetry collector. Uh, it's Cisco specific today. Um, but yeah, this is using Pipeline, out, out, you know, outputting to something like InfluxDB or Kafka. And then we're just using Grafana on top of that. Like I said, here's a couple of different you know, telemetry paths. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier, the idea with all these designs <laughs> is to, to tell people what they should monitor and how they should monitor it. Because like I said, a lot of times, if you look at these paths, you know, that's not super intuitive. Um, it's hard to dig through a model and figure out where all these things are at. Uh, and the device doesn't tell you where to do it. So, and it's the same across, across all vendors. So that was the idea is, you know, we'll tell you what to monitor. Like this is, you know, we'll give you the configuration to monitor these specific things if you, if you want to do that. 